So we went through verbally an example. So let's look at and do our physical example. You guys have that handout I asked you to find. And we're going to just throw one out here off the cuff. We're going to run through the whole gamut. If you notice, you've got uh, the different uh, information here, and you've got the feeder information for five and six. All the steps are li listed there for you. I've got an example on the board that mimics that same drawing. First thing we want to do is, is think about a voltage source. You know, typically we're talking about motors, we're talking about a three phase system, right? So we're going to go three phase. Now the question is, are we in a light commercial building with 208 or are we in a more industrial sized building with 480? We're going to go 480. So we got to figure that out. So that's the premises, we, that's just what we're dealt. So now let's figure out some horsepowers. Um, one, Typical horsepower you guys are used to feel, anybody used to dealing with motors? What well, typical horsepower you might be dealing with? 480 volt three phase. Five horsepower is a typical one. Let's get a big one. What do you think? Let's go with 40. Let's get a big one. Now I'm going to give you some nameplate information that the uh, test providing, the test questions would have to give you nameplate information. So your nameplate information, this one have a temp of 38 degrees Celsius. This nameplate over here have a service factor 1.4. Okay? That's the information that the test provider would have to provide to you on the test question, you know, because you're looking at the nameplate of a motor. So what is step number one in our six step format? So step number one, what is, uh, we're dealing with 40 volt three phase, we're looking at that 430.250 table. What's the horsepower at five horsepower? What's the impasse of the full load current? 7.6 amps. And for a 40 horsepower, what's the full load current of that? That's step number one. That's not hard, right? That's just looking at a table, picking information off of a table. Step number two talks about these uh, overload relays or overload heaters. And we're going to use nameplate information for those. We're going to go to 430.32. Let's look for that. 430.32. On this five horsepower motor, we've got the nameplate rating. It says uh, we got a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius. What's our percentage we're going to use for that? Let everybody get to the right page. You were correct, 125%. Because we've got a temperature rise of 40 degrees C or less, right? 38 degrees C is less than 40. So on this one, it's going to be 125%. What's 125% of the FLC, right? So 125% times 7.6 equals what? 9.5 amps. Now over on the 40 horsepower motor, we got a nameplate information that's got a service factor 1.4. What's our percentage we're gonna use over here? 1.15 or greater? And we're at 1.4, so 125% times what? Our full load current is 52 amps, right? What's that equal? 65 amps? Okay, that's step number two. So what we can look at, just kind of get our point of reference, we got a 7.6 amp motor at full load current. It's going to trip once it gets to 9.5. We got a 52 amp motor over there, it's going to trip once it gets to 65 amps. I tell people all the time about motors. Motors are dumb. There is no intelligence to a motor. A motor will run until it burns itself out. We have to provide the intelligence for it, right? We have to provide the protection for it. A motor will just run and run and run. Now our step number three talks about this wire size. And it tells us that we need 125% of the full load current. Well, we've already done that math, graciously. We've already done that once. We need a wire that's good enough for 9.5 amps. And let's say the test question tells you you're going to be using THWN-2. THWN-2. What wire size are we going to use? We're going to go to page 161, our 310.16 table. We got to find a wire size good enough in THWN-2, good enough for 9.5 amps. Number 14 gauge wire, because number 14 gauge wire is the only selection we have, right? that gets us in that range, right? 
So 14, and by the way, 14 is the smallest branch circuit wire size you're allowed anyway. Now you get some controls, you can get some smaller wires, but branch circuit wire size, 14 is the smallest you can get for a branch circuit. Our step number three over here, we're gonna be using that THWN-2, right? And we need a wire size good enough, 125% of 52 amps and 65 amps. Wire size good enough for 65 amps, and that wire size is what? Number six. That's step number three. So far, so good, right? Just following the steps. Then the test question will provide you with which style fuse or circuit breaker we're gonna use, right? For step number four. So step number four sizes that fuse or circuit breaker. Since we actually have a symbol that represents a switch, a fuse, I'm sorry, a uh, breaker, we'll use the inverse time circuit breaker, which is a standard everyday circuit breaker. What is our percentage for that? For an inverse time circuit breaker, 430.52 table, not an instantaneous trip, and the inverse time. 250%, right? So 250% times our full low current, our full low current, remember? 7.6, right? What's that equal? 19, even? Got me some change there. 19 even? All right, he's good. So 19 is not a standard fusion circuit breaker size. Well, what can we do? What we gotta do? Over here, we're going to be using that 250% again. We're going to multiply that times our full load current. Full load current is 52 amps, right? What's that equal? Even? Is 130 a standard fusion circuit breaker size? So what are we going to do? Step number four is taken care of. Now we're taking care of all our branch information, right? Branch is taken care of. Step number five talks about a feeder. Now, the reason why we got two uh, branches here is they're connected to a feeder. So this feeder conductor size up here be step number five, right? That feeder conductor size tells us to do what on our number five format? 125% largest, which is going to be what? 52 amps, right? And then plus all others, right? And all others equals a 7.6, right? So that'd be the way it looks. So 52 amps times 125%, what is what the sum of that is? We've done that once, right? 65 plus the 7.6, right? What's that equal? Okay, so we need a wire good enough for 72.6 amps. What wire size would that be? 75 degrees Celsius column always, all motors. So number four, everybody with us on that? Then our last piece, step number six right here. Now step number six has, is dependent on step number four. We can't do step six unless step four has already been done. What's it tell us to do? It tells us to take the uh, largest branch fusion circuit breaker size we've already chosen, right? And then add the full low current of all others, right? So our largest one, right, is 150 amps. So 150 amps from step number four, right, plus all others. All others is our only other motors is 7.6, right? 7.6. So we come up with 157.6. And that's not a standard fuser circuit breaker size, is it? Can we go up? Gotta go down. So this answer for step number six is 150 amps. Full all six different pieces here. They're probably going to ask you on test question pieces, not, not all, just pieces. But now let's look through this. We went from the end result to the beginning, right? 
We didn't go from the beginning to the end in the thought process. We had to figure out what our load was, then size of overload, then size of wire based on the load, size of breaker based on the uh, keeping in, in ideal of that inrush current, right? The inrush current is what we're trying to compensate for. We're not protecting the wire. We're not going to take a, uh, well in this case we got a 20 amp breaker for a 14 gauge wire. That's not too far out of kilter from your normal thought pattern. But over here we got a 150 amp breaker for a number 6 gauge wire. That's out of, definitely not something you'd be accustomed to doing, right? And then we got this uh, number 4 gauge wire for a feeder and it's protected with a 150 amp breaker. And these are the answers to the question. I'm going to change one parameter and show you how extreme this can be. Instead of using that inverse time circuit breaker, right, change one parameter. We're going to use an instantaneous trip circuit breaker. What's our percentage for an instantaneous trip circuit breaker? So, so we're just going to change one thing, and let's start right here. So for instantaneous trip circuit breaker, it'd be 800%. So 800% of what? The 7.6, right? So we'll make this little breakout right here just to kind of get us understanding here. What's 800 times 7.6? Now we're allowed to go up. 60.8 is not standard size, so we're allowed to go up, right? Be a 75 amp. Okay? Over here, we've got instantaneous trip circuit breaker. And again, it's 800%, right? Times, in this case, 52 amps. 416. And we're, we're allowed to go up. What's 416 goes to 450, right? So 450. And then obviously, on step number six, if we took 450 and added 7.6 to it, we can't go up. This one up here is going to be instantaneous trip circuit breaker. Will also be 450, right? Change one parameter and we change everything as far as the protection. And it makes you say, no, that's not right. I can't do it that way. The inspector would make fun of me, right? If I took a 450 amp breaker and connected this number four gauge wire to it, or a 75 amp breaker and connected some 14 gauge wire to it, or a 450 amp breaker and connected some number six gauge wire to it, that's the right answer on test day. 